are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is a survived case about an 11 year old found alone in the middle of the ocean. Now, what if I told you a child would be able to keep themselves alive for almost four days? Add on top of that being traumatized by what had just happened to their entire family. This wasn't a simple sinking either. This was much much worse. I also want to thank June's Journey for sponsoring today's video and you guys know that I love this game so much and I know that a lot of you love it as well so I'm so very happy to be celebrating their third anniversary today with you guys. If you don't know what June's Journey is, it is a memory and mystery solving game with the most beautiful vintage backdrop. Not only are you solving these fictional crimes but you're also earning pieces of decor to add to your property. It takes you back in time and makes you feel like a real detective while being in scenes so beautiful you'll think they have to be based on movie sets. This is seriously such a wonderful game to not only just distract you from stressful things happening in your life but it's also helping you with your memory and helping it so you are more aware of your surroundings which is always a good thing in a world like we live in today. So I really do hope that you try June's Journey if you haven't already because they do deserve all of the success in the world. So if you haven't tried it out, please make sure to use the link in my description box. The link just tracks how many of you guys wanted to play because of me. So again, it will be linked down below and thank you so much June's Journey for sponsoring this portion of the video. Now let's get back to the story. So it was actually 1961 in the Bahamas, and the Duperalt family were on vacation at this time. They were originally from Green Bay, Wisconsin, and this was parents Arthur and Jean. Arthur was a 41-year-old successful optometrist, and Jean was his 38-year-old wife. Now, they also had three children together. The oldest was a 14-year-old boy named Brian, then it was 11-year-old Terry Joe, and then it was 7-year-old Renee. And and they all decided to take a little bit tough time away from their lives and their work and to take this vacation together. The main goal of this vacation wasn't to just have fun though. You see, Arthur wanted to make this a trial run. He was a you know, a, a successful, accomplished sailor as well, and wanted to see if he could take his family on a voyage that would last a year going all around the world. But to make sure that they would even be up for this, he wanted to take them out for a week to see if they could even do anything like this or if it was something they would enjoy doing. So that is what they were doing when they were going to the Bahamas. They headed out on the 60-foot yacht called the Bluebell and they were going from Florida. They had drove from Wisconsin to Florida and they were going from Florida to the Bahamas. And everything seemed to be going so extremely well during this time and Arthur was really excited for what they could do in the future. Now in order for everyone to have a good time and relax, they also brought a few more people on board, not just the family. This was a 44 year old captain who also doubled as a tour guide to assist them. He was also one of Arthur's friends so he knew the family well. His name was Julian Harvey and he had a lot of experience because he had been a Marine. Now he would be with the family the entire entire trip taking care of them and he also brought along his wife Mary. Once they arrived in the Bahamas, the family were doing normal vacation things. You know, they were doing spearfishing, snorkeling, exploring, eating seafood, and all of the activities that they couldn't really do in Wisconsin. They loved it so much and they were telling everyone they could that they planned to come back as early as Christmas of that year. And this was already November, so they planned to come back pretty quickly because they enjoyed it so much. A week later, they had to return home though, and although none of them wanted to go back to their mundane routines. They pretty much had to. They had to go back to work and to school and this would be the plan. However, no one would be making it back. Well, except for one. It was November 16th and a Greek captain named Theo came across a site that he would have never expected to see in the Northwest Providence Channel. 
a member of his crew was actually taking pictures just, you know, of the ocean, of the area, just, you know, having a good time. And he realized upon looking closer exactly what he was looking at in the middle of the water and this is not something that you would normally see. There was a little life raft, a two by five foot cork float just in the middle of the ocean with a tiny girl inside. Now she had no food, water, or anything else with her at all. Her float was basically just a tube that went around what was supposed to be this cork float that had disintegrated and she could only sit on the edge and have her feet swinging, you know, on the other side of it to be able to stay afloat. Upon closer inspection, the crew found that this girl was hours, I mean, possibly even minutes from death. She was severely dehydrated incredibly sunburned and starving. She was barely conscious when they got to her. She was brought up onto their ship wearing pink corduroy pants and a white blouse with no shoes. And the only thing she could tell this crew was that her name was Terry Duperall. But no one knew what in the world had led up to this. No one knew that a little Terry Joe had spent 84 hours all alone, stranded in the middle of the ocean, almost four days. Terry was eventually taken to the hospital and given a proper treatment back in Florida where they had rented this Bluebell boat. And even when she healed, she still wouldn't tell the story of what happened. She was terrified, she was in shock, and she was scared to relive this entire experience. Her story was published on the front pages of newspapers everywhere because this crewman had taken such a incredible looking picture of this little girl in the middle of the ocean and so of course everybody wanted to talk about her story but nobody knew what she had gone through nobody knew anything that she had endured what was even more shocking was what they would find next however it had actually been found three days prior they just finally connected it with cherry joe surviving you see the gulf lion ship found a dinghy and this was with a man and a woman on board. However, they soon realized that only one of them was alive. This man was taken to the United States Coast Guard where he would explain why he had a dead body with him. He claimed that he had been on a yacht where a strong gust of wind brought down the masts and ruptured the gas tank on board, which had caused a fire. Now, he said that he was able to get to this dinghy and he found his wife in the water and he tried to bring her up on the dinghy and resuscitate her, but he couldn't. When he couldn't, he kept her on this dinghy and got away from the ship as it sunk. This was found to be Julian Harvey and his wife, Mary, the couple who had been with the Duperot family on the Bluebell. Mary's autopsy showed that she, in fact, had died of drowning, and Julian said he believed he was the only survivor, that everyone else was stuck on the boat as it went down, and they either, you know, were stuck there as it caught on fire or they drowned trying to escape. Julian said he tried to extinguish the fire, but it wasn't helping, and as he yelled for anybody to see if anybody was still alive, nobody answered. And he said he then saw Terry Jo floating face down near this boat in her life jacket. However, if this was true, how did Terry Jo show up three days later alive? When they finally linked everything together that Terry Jo was on this boat with Julian and they were both survivors, they told Julian this in their custody. And he said, oh my God, why that's wonderful. Unfortunately for Terry, this still meant that her entire family, her parents and her siblings were gone and she was alone at 11 years old. This sweet little girl who loved animals wanted to spend all of her time in the woods pretending to be Tarzan swinging through the forest now had to grow up so much faster than she should have. The next day, this case would get even more strange when another body was found, but not in the ocean. This was at a motel called the Sandman Hotel when a smell began to overwhelm guests. And finally, the staff went in and they found that someone had taken their own life with a double-edged razor. It took a while to figure out who this person was because they had checked in under an alias. But when they identified the body, the whole case started to make a little more sense. You see, 
This was Julian Harvey, and he had taken his own life. Just four days after he had survived in the ocean. They also found a suicide note that was addressed to his friend named James Boozer, and this said, I'm a nervous wreck and just can't continue. I'm going out now. I guess I either don't like life or don't know what to do with it. It also made arrangements of what to do with his son, who was going to adopt him, and also that he wanted his body buried at sea. So why would Julian have done this, being one of two survivors? Was this survivor's guilt? Well, investigators began to hear stories about Julian and how he really acted after being found in the middle of the ocean with a dead body. The crew members who picked him up said he was very calm and collected for being a survivor and someone who just lost his wife and a whole family. The owner of the Blue Bell also said that it was not possible for something like this to happen on his ship because they had just done an inspection and passed. But the most incriminating evidence against Julian thus far was the fact that he had filed two different life insurance claims prior for destroying boats. Although he won both of these claims and got extremely large amounts of money, many claim that on one of these boats he actually steered it until it wrecked and on the other one he had actually been the one to set it on fire. Sound familiar? Exactly what he said happened to the Bluebell. Investigators thought it sounded familiar too. That's when even more was revealed about Julian and the time when he was in the Marines. He had apparently been a skilled bomber pilot and would take the most dangerous test flights and be able to come back and be fine. However, after a lot of these, people around him began to notice that he would often ditch missions just out of nowhere because he claimed engine failure. When he left the military, a lot of people said that his nerves were shot, he had a facial tick and a stutter, and he was definitely different at the end of his career than the beginning. But could he really have killed an entire family and his wife? And if so, what was the motive? Well, since they couldn't ask him, they really needed Terry Joe to talk. An 11-year-old girl held the possible answer to a murder case. However, Unfortunately, they wouldn't be able to charge Julian as he was already deceased. But at least they would have the answers. Now, nearly a week later, investigators finally got to talk to Terry Joe about what had happened. And what she would say would not be released to the public until 50 years later. No matter how many times investigators talked to her, her story didn't change. It wasn't that they didn't believe her as to why they didn't release her story. It's that she did want her story to be released. Terry would end up going to live with her aunt and uncle and some cousins back in Wisconsin, and they would basically take care of her for the rest of her time and try to make her life as normal as possible. Her family was given a plot at the Fort Howard Memorial Park, and she grew up in a very normal home after this. For the next 20 years, she said nothing to anyone. Slowly though, she began to open up to her friends and to a therapist and Terry had actually gotten married and had children and grandchildren and was working at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. The strangest part though is that the department she was working in was as a water management specialist. Terry said that she believes that water is life and it is soothing for her to be on the beach. She says she can think clearly, she can relax, and she feels closer to her lost family. For years, she actually believed that her father was still alive because she didn't see his body. She would go to different beaches to try to look for him. And after 50 years, she finally realized he wasn't coming home. But at this time, she also decided it was time to tell her story to the world. I love my aunt and uncle dearly. And I'm, to, the, to this day, they're my parents. But at that time, I never wanted to let go of my mom and dad. And so growing up, it was very difficult. I didn't believe my father was dead because I had not seen him. I would just pick up and leave on a whim. So I would drive to like North Carolina Beach or Florida the beach looking for my dad. I was always searching. I did that for many, many years, until I was about 35, then I accepted it finally. 
Her book was published in May of 2010 that she co-authored called Alone, Orphaned on the Ocean. And that is when she went into detail about what really happened. Now she said that the night of November 12th, after five days at sea, she went down to the lower cabin to get some sleep. Now normally she was with her little sister Renee and Renee would sleep there with her. However, this night Renee was still on the deck with the adults and actually Brian and Renee, her siblings, were sleeping up there. And so the parents just left them and Terry went down to get some sleep in her normal spot. This was around 9 p.m. and about two hours later at 11 p.m. Terry was woken up by screaming and she heard someone saying, help daddy, help. She quickly realized that this was her brother Brian and that he sounded like he was in danger. She was too terrified to move though and so she sat in her bed listening as footsteps ran back and forth above her. Finally, she decided to move and she used all the courage that she could muster to walk basically up the stairs and open the door and she immediately saw her mom and her brother in a pool of blood. She knew that they were already dead. She said outside on the deck there was no storm, there was no chaos of the sea. It was just chaos on their boat. And I woke up to my brother screaming and he was screaming, help, daddy, help. It was one of those screams that you knew something bad was happening. You knew that he was in danger. I decided to go up on deck and find out what was happening. As I came out here, and this would have been the kitchen. My brother and brother were lying there and there was a big pool of blood. I don't know if I knew they were dead I thought I saw blood in one area of the cockpit. I also thought that I saw a rifle. If that wasn't horrifying enough, she then saw a figure walking towards her. She was terrified until she realized that it was Julian Harvey. And she asked him what happened and he immediately shoved her back downstairs. She stayed there tucked away, not wanting to go up again until her cabin started to fill with water. She still couldn't move and then she saw Julian in the doorway holding what she believed to be a rifle and she stood there not breathing, not doing anything and finally he turned and left her alone. But she knew at this point that the ship was sinking and she had to get out. Her mattress was floating. This was how high the water already was. Terry said that's when she began to wade through the water and through the ship praying that she wouldn't bump into the dead bodies of her family members. That is when she saw Julian messing with the dinghy and asked him if the boat was sinking. He actually answered and told her it was and then handed her a line to hold on to the dinghy. Now she accidentally dropped it and in a panic Julian actually dove into the water to go after this dinghy leaving Terry on the sinking boat the only survivor. She knew she was going to die if she didn't do anything and so she using her survival skills remembered that there was another lifeboat on the other side of this boat and so she went over there she untied it as quickly as she could she threw it in the water threw herself on it and they actually both went underwater for a while before coming back up. She knew it was do that or die and so she did it. Back down and I got back in my bed. I just laid there and then water started coming into my cabin. Then he came in my cabin and he had a gun in his hand and he just stared at me. We made eye contact and he didn't say anything and he backed out. He didn't kill Terry Joe because he knew the boat was sinking and she was a goner. So I decided that I couldn't stay there any longer because the water was making my mattress float. So I waded through and I went on top of the deck again. The captain dove overboard into the night and he swam after the dinghy and disappeared. Meanwhile, the boat's sinking. And Terry Jo somehow had the presence of mind to remember that there was a life float lashed to the, to the deck. I knew the boat was going down and it was do this or die. I scrambled over the sails to the top of the deck where I knew a cork raft was, untied it, threw it over the side and got in it. The line on the float actually snagged on the bluebell for a moment and pulled her and the float underwater, but it, it freed itself and she came back up. That was the first time I really was afraid because the way Harvey left me there, 
I knew that something bad had happened, and I was afraid of him. And that's why I, I didn't say anything. I didn't call out. I stayed, you know, perfectly still. It was like I was trying to hide, and here you are in the middle of the ocean in a little raft. How can you hide? The boat was gone. No lights, nothing. She drifted away, hoping that Julian wouldn't see her and come back after her. And for the next three and a half days, she floated in the water. She was burning, thirsty, starving, and scared. She began hallucinating that there was actually a small island nearby, but when she got closer, it disappeared. The rest of the boat was also disintegrating besides this tube, and she had to sit on it with her legs in the water. And that's when she began to be nibbled on by porpoises, or mammals that look like dolphins but have extremely sharp teeth. Now, at one point, a small red airplane circled overhead and Terry began to flail her arms trying to get their attention, but they passed, not seeing her. She said she began to thank God for the small creatures that made whooshing sounds as they came to the service to get some air because she felt comforted that she wasn't alone when they would do that. She would fall in and out of sleep and her dreams were often of her father who was drinking a glass of red wine and so she would wake up even more lonely and thirsty. What I didn't tell you was that it was said when the ship finally found Terry, they couldn't immediately get to her because there were sharks swimming around her as well. They had to wait until they moved along to bring her onto the ship and then a helicopter had to take her to the hospital. Terry said that that's pretty much what she remembered. But Terry did say that she went under hypnosis at one time to see if she could remember anything else. And they used sodium amytal, which is often described as a truth serum because it's able to extract statements for, from past experiences that you may not remember. Now, Terry was able to remember even more because of this. And she said she saw a knife on deck. Before then, she had never seen a murder weapon other than the possible rifle in Julian's hands. But Terry had lived through her entire family, not just drowning or catching on fire, but being murdered by someone that they had invited on their ship, someone they thought was a friend. But why would he do this? What was his motive? And why did he kill his own wife as well? Well, you see, it was found that Julian had multiple wives before Mary. Mary was actually his sixth, and they had been together for three months at this point. He didn't stay with his wives long, he married them quickly, and would divorce them by simply saying he didn't love them anymore, and that was that. But something even more horrendous is that 12 years prior to this, he was with one of his wives and his wife's mother when he would get into a car accident, and they would drive off a wooden bridge into 15 feet of water. These two women would be killed, but Julian had survived. Now, was this just a coincidence that he just had, you know, a knack at surviving and he was just meant to be the lone survivor in all of these accidents? Or was it something else? Both a police officer and a diver who investigated that case of the car accident said there was no way that Julian could have gotten away unharmed unless he had planned how to get out prior. He was said to even brag about the fact that he could escape and instead of trying to save his wife's life, he was sitting up there talking to everybody about what he did. And afterwards, he cashed in his wife's life insurance policy. So, it wasn't too out of the ordinary to think that Julian had killed his sixth wife, Mary, as well. But a whole family? Not as likely. But because he was deceased and no one could really question him on motive, of course the theories started to emerge. It was speculated that Julian Harvey had gone on this trip for one reason, to get rid of his wife. Mary just happened to have a $20,000 life insurance policy and from the insurance claims that Julian had gotten from previous ships that broke down, everyone knew that Julian had a way of making the most out of the traumatic events that happened to him. Many knew that this was because he actually caused them. But with Terry's story, a timeline was put together of what really happened that night on the Bluebell or what they believed happened. It's theorized that Julian murdered his wife in their cabin and had been in the process of throwing her overboard to make it seem like she had fallen and make him not appear guilty. But 
when Mary put up such a fight, it had actually woken up Arthur, Terry's father, and he had come to see what was wrong. When Julian hadn't been able to get Mary overboard, the crime scene wasn't cleaned up. The finger pointed directly at him as being a murderer. So Julian then went for Arthur. Arthur was then stabbed to death without even realizing what was happening, and then Jean and their oldest, Brian, were next. It's unknown what happened to Terry's younger sister, Renee, but she was most likely killed as well, being upstairs, because Julian was thought to have seen all of them as possible witnesses who could identify him as the killer. But the next part of the story baffled many. Why did he let Terry live? He sure seemed to contemplate killing her as he watched her in the doorway, yet he handed her the rope of the dinghy like he was going to take her with him. Some say this is because he wanted to get caught and to stop killing. However, some say that they believe he was just waiting to kill her when they were both on the dinghy and away from the boat to make sure she was dead. Because remember, the only reason that she was freed from him was that she had dropped the rope on accident, which possibly saved her life as he jumped in the water after it. Terry herself believes that Julian was going to leave her there and thought that she would go down with the ship and he wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. Another question was, why take all of the time and effort to get a dead body onto this dinghy with you that was his wife? Well, it was thought that Julian was dead set on getting her insurance policy and an unsolved disappearance would put a wrench in that at least for a little while. So it was thought that his thinking was the best way to prove that she was dead was to bring her with him. The rest of the Duperot family and the Bluebell has never been found. The raft that Terry was on was actually completely white, other than, of course, the part that was disintegrating, but the actual tube she was sitting on was white, and it was so hard to see even when they had helicopters going around, you know, the area because the waves were all so white. And so after this happened, everything changed, and they began to everywhere on all boats change everything to the orange color that we see today. Terry is now more than ready to talk about what she's been through and has gone on several interviews herself. On today, she said, I was never frightened. I was an outdoors child and I loved the water. I had strong faith. I believed in God and I prayed for him to help me and I just went with the flow. She also told CBS News, I always believed I was saved for a reason, but it took me 50 years to gain the strength to be able to give other people hope with my story. Now at a book signing, Terry was actually met by teachers of hers from around this time after she survived when she went back to school and they wanted to come to see if she was all right and to apologize to her for not saying and helping more because they said that they were told to pretend it never happened and so they couldn't talk to her about it. And so Terry went on most of her life not talking about it to anybody because of that. Throughout the years, I had a lot of ups and downs, and I've worked with that, and I think it's to be expected of someone who has gone through what I went through. As I became an adult, I really did realize that, that my mother was a survivor. I think her, her strong will and everything uh, panned out throughout all of her life. But she is now done staying silent, and in her book, it says, What I want to stress to you all who read this book is never give up. Always have hope and try to look on the bright side of things. Be positive, be trusting, and try to go with the flow. Have compassion, give of yourself to those in need, and be loving and kind. I believe that what you give comes back to you. And that is the story of the 11-year-old girl who survived four days alone on the ocean, on a tiny little disintegrating float. I'm so fortunate that I had my family. Well, I hope that I can just continue to be healthy and happy and, you know, have the wonderful love that I share with my family and, and friends, and that I hope that that can be always that way. I thought that this was a wonderful story to add to our survival series. And if you haven't watched all of them, there will be a playlist in the description. But it is definitely, I can't even imagine. Not only are you in the middle of the ocean, but you just know that your family has been murdered. And the fact that she has come out on top and stayed such a beautiful soul. And, you know, took her time, but is now finally telling her story is so beautiful. It just goes to show that sometimes you will take a while to, to heal enough to be able to talk. 
but when you do, it's going to be so wonderful and there will be a time when you can heal enough to do so. And I just think that's a beautiful message. You know, at 11 years old, she may have not been ready, but she is now. And her not being ready didn't make her weak. It just made her smart because she was able to recognize that she just, it wasn't the right time and she needed more time to heal. And sometimes that's okay. So I want you all to know that as well, that healing takes time. And even if it takes you years longer than somebody else, that doesn't mean that you didn't deserve it. It doesn't mean that you were, you know, less strong than somebody who healed in half the time. You know, when you go through traumatic events, one of the most amazing things that you can do is to share with other people how to get through their traumatic events. So don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.